And you, you can have your main event of the evening. Hello and welcome to These Days Are Hours, a Happy Days podcast. I'm Peter. And I'm Joe. And today, we will be discussing Season 5, Episode 23, The Fourth Anniversary Show, a.k.a. Richie's Girl Exposes the Cunninghams. Okay, Peter, tell us what happens in Richie's Girl Exposes the Cunninghams. We open with Lori Beth and Marion in the Cunninghams' kitchen, having a hush conversation about something Lori Beth needs Marion's help with. I have to talk to you about something. Oh, as Marion assures Lori Beth that Richie's a nice boy, Lori Beth reveals that this is about a term paper she's writing. Howard enters, and Lori Beth explains that her paper is about the typical middle-class American family, and Richie doesn't want her talking to his family because he thinks she'll try to dig up information on his old girlfriends. She asks them what it's like being middle-class parents. Marion says it's wonderful. They get to share in their children's sad and happy moments, and she flashes back to Richie winning a basketball game, then Richie winning a game show, then Richie in the ROTC, then Richie and Patsy's car rolling into the lake. You want to buy a car? <laughs> Howard says being a parent is a big responsibility, and the best thing one can do is give good advice. He flashes back to advising Marion to give Joni the talk, then giving Richie a pep talk, and then Richie, Ralph, and Patsy getting mobbed by the girls they scanned with a fake beauty pageant. It's a fake! You three boys ran a fake beauty contest? Which doesn't really seem to fit thematically, but uh, okay. Lori Beth heads over to Arnold's. She asks Chachi if she can talk to him, and he hits on her. He finally gave up old carrot top for the passionate Italian. <laughs> she asks him about the Cunninghams and how he gets along with them. According to Chachi, he gets along especially well with the Cunningham women. And there's a montage of Chachi flirting with Marion and Joni. Then Lori Beth talks to Fonzie, who says he's going to tell her about middle class families, being as close as he is to the Cunninghams, and then instead tells her about the times he jumped over a shark and the time he jumped over 14 trash cans. Am I dead? <laughs> Now, was that not a superb bit of information? Lori Beth tells Fonzie she's looking for information on the Cunninghams. Fonzie seems hurt that he might not be in the term paper, especially when Lori Beth points out he's not very middle class. Fonzie does admit the Cunninghams are his favorite subject, and says he'll tell Lori Beth something no one knows about the Cunninghams. Fonzie loves the Cunninghams as if they were his own, but they aren't exactly typical. There are times when he thinks they might be, well, wacko. Wacko. Then there's a montage of various hijinks the Cunninghams have gotten up to, you know. Howard in the screw hat, Marion hula hooping, Richie in drag, Marion in her Princess Fatima getup, Howard panicking over a fire in Fonzie's apartment, stuff like that. That is a little strange. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, eventually you get used to him, you know? Fonzie says to Lori Beth that despite the oddness, he still thinks of himself and the Cunninghams as peas in a pod. Then there's a montage of Fonzie and the Cunninghams being all familial with each other. Lori Beth talks to Al next. Did I ever tell you about Rosa Coletti? <laughs> well, she was middle class. Probably still is. Lori Beth says that while most of her paper is about the Cunninghams, she should probably say something about The Bachelor in middle-class society. Al says she can truthfully say that The Bachelor is always in the thick of things. Then there's a montage of Al interacting with the rest of the cast. Lori Beth talks to Potsy next, who says he's glad he didn't get stuck with the paper on middle-class families. He also claims his family is really nice, except his father, and there's a montage of Potsy's disturbing stories about his father. Hi, I didn't know Mr. Weber had a son. He doesn't tell anyone. Interesting choice there. Lori Beth then talks to Ralph, who initially takes Lori Beth not wanting him to tell Richie about this as a sign that she's into him. Lori Beth bluntly shuts him down. Ralph, I'm just writing a story. <laughs> yeah. And Ralph says that he and his dad would be a good choice of a term paper, and then there's a montage of Ralph and his dad's relationship. You know, I just came back from Africa and I played cards with the natives. Zulus? No, I won. Lori Beth interviews Joni back at the Cunningham house next about what it was like growing up in this environment. It was nice. Real nice. Joni says it was a learning experience, and there's a montage of Joni butting in on things. Mostly Richie's love life. Richie comes home, and Joni leaves. Richie gets pissy about Lori Beth writing the paper that he didn't want her to write, accuses her of snooping into his old girlfriends, and decides to tell her himself. Well, I'll bet you everybody's telling you all about my old girlfriends now, aren't they? Richie, I don't want to know about your old girlfriend. Yeah, sure. All right. Then there's a montage of Richie's love interests. Lori Beth assures Richie that she doesn't care about that. Richie has old girlfriends just like Lori Beth has old boyfriends. Then Richie gets pissy about Lori Beth dating people before him, but he thankfully quickly gets over it after Lori Beth points out that now they have each other. Then they study together and immediately take a break to neck. Back at Arnold's, 
Lori Beth concludes in her term paper that the typical American middle-class family is alive and well in Milwaukee. Then there's a clip of the Cunninghams around the piano having a sing-along, and Fonzie saying he loves middle-class families. Thank you so much, Peter. That was Richie's Girl Exposes the Cunninghams, which first aired back on Friday, March 23rd, 1978. Happy Days had been in reruns for weeks, and this was the closest thing to a new episode in March or April of 1978. That night being a Friday, Happy Days served as a lead into a new episode of Fish. It's always home sweet home in the Fish household. In which Fish's wife, Bernice, sprains her ankle, and Fish's secret admirer volunteers to help in the kitchen. CBS had a new episode of The Waltons, in which John Boy proposes marriage to his girlfriend Daisy only to learn that Daisy has a secret daughter and cannot marry him and NBC had a rerun of Chips in which Officer John Baker befriends an injured dog so Peter, what are you watching on that Friday night? I'm interested in the secret daughter and how that would prevent someone from getting married Well these were olden days when this was more scandalous. Good point Personally, I'm not watching any of that stuff It's 1978, I'm gonna go to a roller disco or something it's, There's gotta be something more fun to do on a Friday night in March 1978 than watch any of those shows that I just named I'm sure that any of those shows would be much more enjoyable to watch on cocaine Richie's Girl Exposes the Cunninghams was directed by Jerry Paris, with some segments directed by George Tyne and Herb Wallerstein and it was written by Bob Runner and Gary Marshall himself, writing under the pseudonym Samuro Mitsubi There are over 30 contributing writers credited for this show, from Dick Bensfield to Steve Zacharias, I'm not going to name them all. Thank God for small papers! And as for guest stars this week, we either have none, or we have a whole bunch we have appearances by Tita Bell, Maureen McCormick, Talia Balsam, Ed Peck, Dave Madden, Jack Dodson, James Van Patten, Virginia Gregg, and many, many more. But they're all from other episodes. Would you consider us having any guest stars in this episode? Not really, no. Most of them are only there for like a split second, and then they just disappear. So I wouldn't really count them. And also, they're not really there. Being they're filmed. memories, all they're alone m- in the moonlight. In the lamplight, the withered leaves collect at my little feet. In the last anniversary show, when Nancy Walker was there in the Cunningham living room, singing and dancing up a storm, that's a guest appearance. As for songs, it was mostly replacement music in my copy of the episode. We do get to hear that jaunty Jump the Shark music again. That was nice. That was nice. And I guess we also get Moonlight Bay performed by the entire cast. But I think this was from the AKA The Fonz episode. I love middle class families. As for cultural and historical references this week, one of Marion's grocery bags says Gelson's, founded in 1951 and still going strong today. Gelson's is a chain of supermarkets in Southern California. I'm proud to say that Gelson's is the only multi store retailer here in Southern California that's licensed to carry the certified Angus Beef brand of Prime. They have no Wisconsin locations, so Marion is going way out of her way to do her grocery shopping this week. Among her purchases are a box of Quaker Instant Oatmeal and some Instant Mashed Potatoes. The packaging on both of those is very 1970s looking. Instant Oatmeal didn't even exist until 1966. But Peter, this is the power of television. I went shopping yesterday, and you know what I got? I got a box of Instant Oatmeal because this episode put it in my mind. Oh, wow! Instant Quaker Oatmeal comes in flavors so good that you know what we're going to do? Do, Timmy? What? We're gonna make a hot, hot cereal lover out of you. Out of me? Out of you. Out of him? We're gonna make a hot cereal lover out of you. With instant Quaker oatmeal. You did it. It brainwashed you. It, it put subliminal messages into your brain. Happy Days is in the grip of big oatmeal, apparently. Howard jokes about the love life of J. Edgar Hoover. Is it an expose on the love life of J. Edgar Hoover? (laughs) Born in Washington, D.C. in 1895, Hoover is known for being the frighteningly powerful director of the FBI from its founding in 1935 to Hoover's death in 1972. He had previously headed the Bureau of Investigation, the predecessor to the FBI, starting in 1924. He's attached to the Bureau of Investigation. His love life, or his lack of a love life, has been the subject of intense speculation for decades. Hoover never married and 
and lived with his mother well into adulthood, leading many to suspect he was a closeted homosexual. There are other stories that say he was bisexual, some that say he was asexual. I say believe what you will. I also found out that he had the world's largest collection of pornography. Some say he used it for personal gratification. Some say he used it to blackmail people. Hoover's sexuality is a whole thing. There's more than I can convey to you in a podcast. Wow, uh, this took a turn that I did not expect. I, I knew about all of that up until it got to the massive porn collection. It's like a one second joke in Happy Days, but it could be a documentary series about the sexuality of Herbert Hoover. Does J. Edgar Hoover is gay? Joni mentions Confidential. This was a magazine about celebrity scandals that ran from 1952 to 1978. It has been referenced many times on Happy Days. Confidential magazine didn't win a Pulitzer Prize. It was a scrappy publication printed on mediocre paper with trashy two-color headlines. A poor cousin to the glossy supermarket tabloids of today. Yet this 50s magazine struck fear into the biggest, most powerful people in Hollywood. In fact, Maureen McCormick was actually seen reading about Leopold and Loeb in Confidential. Other observations this week. I like how welcoming and friendly the Cunninghams are to Lori Beth. She and Richie are not married yet, but Howard and Marion already treat her as one of the family. I think that was probably my favorite aspect of this episode was just how nice the Cunninghams are to Lori Beth. Yeah, it, it draws an interesting parallel to Fonzie, who is also a non-blood member of their family who they nevertheless functionally have adopted by now. On the other hand, Richie's obsession with his old girlfriends is weird. Lori Beth genuinely does not seem to be interested interested in this topic, but Richie will not let it go. He is a jerk for no real reason. He really is. He only appears near the end in person and not in flashback, but throughout the episode, Lori Beth keeps telling people, hey, don't tell Richie about this. He really doesn't want me to do this. Except apparently this was assigned to her by the school, so it's not like she can not do it. I guess she could find a different middle class family to write her paper about, but even so, Richie, she does not care about your old girlfriends. Grow up. I think the only reason he's acting this way is to provide some semblance of conflict in this otherwise conflict-free episode so they can resolve it near the end and then act like there has been a story this week. Speaking of those old clips, I tried to see if there was anything in them that struck me as new or interesting this time. It still bothers me that they didn't turn off those goddamn sprinklers during the ROTC demonstration. This would have been an easy fix. Hey guys, we're having a ROTC demonstration at one o'clock. Can you please not run the sprinklers on the football field at that time. You know what I noticed this time around? When Chachi is telling Lori Beth about how he really gets along well with the Cunningham women, there's a clip from Joni's first kiss where he's selling Marion prunes, and at one point he rubs his cheek on her shoulder. I noticed that too. He gets very familiar with her and starts nuzzling up to her like... <laughs> Like it's, a puppy. it's so weird. Was that in the episode itself and I just didn't mention it? Or did they just decide to throw it in here for some reason? Was it an alternate take? What? I think it's in the original episode because it's the thing that makes Marion change her mind about buying the prune pitter. Hey, it's editor Joe talking. I checked the original episode and that clip is in there. Speaking of clips from the old episodes, man, they must have loved that Lifesavers joke. Here, have a Lifesaver. It'll make it <laughs> from A Shot in the Dark. They couldn't wait to run that thing again. Hey, remember the time we referenced a 1970s ad campaign in the middle of our 1950s show? This joke won't hold up at all. Let's run this clip again. So, <laughs> in their defense, I will say that that joke absolutely kills. The studio audience is just freaking devastated. And it's the same thing, though, like, what's up? Or where's the beef? And everybody thinks it's hilarious. Why is that funny to people? Mentioning, like, a current ad campaign. I feel like it hits the same sweet spot that memes do nowadays. Only instead of mostly being homegrown they were the result of money being funneled into these omnipresent ad campaigns. It's just like the cognitive dissonance of this 1970s ad campaign that by the way no one remembers I can't even find too many of those 1970s Lifesaver commercials. It's no you got peanut butter in my chocolate That would have been even funnier because Donnie Most is in the real thing So Yes! Mmm chocolate Mmm peanut butter I was a little annoyed by this next one. The mid-episode cliffhanger where Fawn says he's going to tell Lori Beth a secret that no one knows about the Cunninghams, for me, turned out to be a big letdown, and it definitely did not deserve the suspenseful music that they gave it. Nobody knows about... 
they need to put in some more fake conflict. That's exactly it. They don't have a show here, so they're trying to pretend like they have a show. I guess I liked the cosplay and role-playing montage. That's kind of fun for a few seconds. I got a little tiny bit of enjoyment out of this. But this next one is a possible Happy Days milestone. Could this be the first time that Al says, yep, 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 yep. I think it is. It definitely became his catchphrase along with Chachi, Chachi, Chachi. He even says yep, yep, yep in the Weezer video. Not so good, Al. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember him saying it before. It feels a little bit late for it, but better late than never, I guess. I also like that the montages were pretty democratic. Fonzie gets a montage, Richie, Al, Potsy, Ralph, Joni, they all get their own montages, and they're about of equal length. In a way, it's nice that they're still showing clips from the pilot. That kind of brought you back to the origins of Happy Days, except that they already used this clip from the pilot once. They excerpted it in Who's Sorry Now? It's the thing of Richie on his date with Arlene, and he keeps leaning on the door and falling Mm -hmm. into the apartment. I have a nice time anyway. Who is it? There's only so many times I can find this funny. I still found it a little bit funny. I don't know. We reviewed the pilot, and then we reviewed Who's Sorry Now, and now we're seeing this. And in a way, it's become sort of the Homer Simpson jumping Springfield gorge of happy days. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. This is the greatest thrill of my life. I'm king of the world. Woohoo! Woohoo! I... Ah! So, Peter, were there any outstanding Happy Days fashions this week? Speaking of the pilot slash who's sorry now, I liked that we got to see the leather jacket that Richie was wearing during his date with Arlene back then. So that was a fun little thing. I really liked Lori Beth's outfit. I really thought the scarf she was wearing was really nifty. Other than that, it was a pretty meh episode fashion-wise. Did you have any other observations that you wanted to make about Richie's Girl Exposes the Cunninghams? Aside from the realization that Shachi is a lot creepier than even I had thought, not really. So, Peter, I will ask that age-old, timeless question. Was this episode any good? All clip shows are kind of unnecessary. And this one, yeah, it doesn't really do anything to prove that it's necessary. It just sort of happens. There isn't really much to it. Like you said, it's nice that the Cunninghams have already kind of accepted Lori Beth as one of their own. But aside from that, it's just kind of there. I will admit that I struggled to get through this episode the first time. It just seemed really dumb. It seemed like even out of the clip shows, it's lame, even by clip show standards. The last time we had a clip show, we had Nancy Walker in the living room singing and dancing her heart out. That's at least something. This is nothing. They have nothing. They have a half hour of nothing, and it's leading up to an episode of Fish. But the second time I watched it, I kind of got into the warm family atmosphere of it, I guess. That's how they get you. I did get involved in the family dynamics of it, except I didn't like how Richie was written this week. The other thing I didn't mention was that when I saw the plot summary for this episode, I thought they were going to do a full-on parody of An American Family. It was a early 70s PBS reality show. Oh, Pred- wow. It's considered the predecessor to reality television. The- All the way back in the 70s. Exactly. It was the thing that certainly inspired MTV's The Real World. Basically, they took a camera crew into the house of a middle-class family in Santa Barbara, California, the Loud family. The series is about the William C. Loud family of Santa Barbara, California. For seven months, from May 30th, 1971, to January 1st, 1972, the family was filmed as they went about their daily routine. There is no question that the presence of our camera crews and their equipment had an effect on the Louds, one which is impossible to evaluate. The Loud family turned out to be majorly dysfunctional. Actually, the mom and dad ended up getting a divorce. And the son, Lance Loud, came out as gay during the series. He became a gay icon. And the reality TV trend was born. They didn't know that it was going to lead to keeping up with the Kardashians and the real housewives and stuff. They didn't know that that was the end result. But at the time, An American Family was this huge deal. Sitcoms did parodies of it. Sketch shows did parodies of it. There's an entire Albert Brooks movie called Real Life, which parodies an American family. Real Life tells the story of what happens when a real family's life is turned into a major motion picture. That family could have been you. Or you. Or you. 
And I was hoping that that was what this episode was going to be like. That Richie was finally going to come out as gay. And that there was going to be a lot of sturm and drang in the episode. And she was going to expose the Cunninghams. The title says Richie's girl exposes the Cunninghams. No, she damn doesn't. Nothing is, is exposed here, except maybe Chachi's perversions, I guess. It would be a massive exaggeration to say that this was a reference to that documentary series, because it isn't anything like that. There's nothing really to expose here. So that was why I was a little bit disappointed. When do they stop doing the anniversary shows? They keep on doing clip shows until like the last season, I think. Although I think at some point they stop using the anniversary show naming convention. Oh, God. Do they get better? Are there good ones? There's like a great clip show coming up. Well, there is one where Mork shows up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have seen that one. Well, so there's something to look forward to. But anyway, this one was not for me. So no thank you to Richie's Girl Exposed to the Cunninghams, which makes me feel terrible because it's a great showcase for Linda Goodfriend as Lori Beth Allen. And I think Linda Goodfriend gives it her all. I think this is their only time where she gets to be really the central character of the show. Certainly the only time she gets to be the title character of a show. And, and it calls her Richie's Girl. And it does call her Richie's Girl, which is kind of crummy. Linda Goodfriend, you get an A. Everybody else gets like a C minus D plus from me. I'm sorry. So so, Peter, how can people keep up with us and find out about all the wonderful, wonderful things that we are doing? Listeners can follow us on Twitter at Fonzie Podcast. They can follow me on Twitter at Peter Volfranc. That's P-E-T-E-R-V-U-L-F-R-A-N-C. And they can follow me on Twitter at Joe underscore A underscore Blevins. They can find this podcast online at these days or ours dot libsyn dot com. And they can email us with questions, comments, and concerns at these days or ours podcast at gmail dot com. So, Peter, what do we have on the docket for next week? Next week, Fonzie falls in love with a ballerina in Do You Want to Dance? Now that sounds like a step up from this episode. So see you later, alligator. In a while, crocodile. <laughs> <laughs>